The other thing we have to, we have to think about is this. Uh, Hollywood and celebrity gets a lot of recognition. You can't just think of this as a Hollywood problem. And we can't forget the people that can't afford attorneys. We can't forget those people that are afraid to come out to say what happened to them because they have nobody to represent them or to stand up for them. I'm more concerned about that group than I am about the celebrities that are being, that are being exposed and, and immediately get a huge amount of attention. But that attention takes away from the, the rank and file where these kind of crimes of sexual assault are happening daily. In this interview with Brian Hurley, an attorney who brought charges against Catholic church leaders for covering up the sexual abuse of children, you'll learn about the two cases Hurley brought against Planned Parenthood for failing to report the rape of teenage girls. I will tell you, I grossly underestimated what I was getting involved in. Um, I'd been involved in very uh, complex litigation for many years um, as lead counsel, and I thought that would prepare me for uh, litigating against Planned Parenthood, and uh, I was wrong. Planned Parenthood, when it is sued, hires the best lawyers in the United States. Planned Parenthood will fund defense of the defense of litigation uh, in a manner that, uh, from what I could tell in our cases, it, it, that it was a way it was limitless. In both of our cases, Planned Parenthood's lawyers fought every single issue, every aspect of discovery, every aspect of the case was litigated. Uh, much more so, in fact, than I had seen in any of the other cases I had been involved in my 35 years, which I think from my perspective, and this is uh, argued throughout our pleadings, was an attempt to make it prohibitively expensive for us to continue. The majority of the, the plaintiffs in these cases are, are very poor people or people from um, backgrounds where they don't have much money. And it's hard to find lawyers who are willing to sp spend six years litigating against an organization that is going to uh, require you to devote thousands of hours uh, to litigate those claims. And I think that is something that Planned Parenthood and its lawyers are very good at. Planned Parenthood views these cases as a tax on the right to choose to have an abortion. And so that while a case on its own may not seem to have those types of implications, I believe Planned Parenthood's approach to litigation is that every case could have an impact on uh, a woman's right to choose an abortion. And for that reason, they fight every case very strongly. Denise, when I first met her, was 16 years old. Denise's father sexually abused her repeatedly and often for at least three years. Uh, it turned out that uh, she was pregnant. So her father, took her to Planned Parenthood. The Planned Parenthood employee said to her something to the effect, if you're gonna sleep around, you need to get on birth control. And Denise was stunned and she took that as really an insult that she was being called a whore. And so what Denise said, she said in response was, this was not supposed to happen. I was forced to do things I didn't want to do. Um, as soon as I heard her say that, it was clear to me that they had a duty to report um, suspected abuse. I, I think known abuse, but at least suspected abuse. Um, they didn't. Um, and her father continued to rape her for another year. Uh, had they reported Denise's abuse immediately, the abuse would have stopped because her father would have been arrested and ultimately convicted like he was. Unfortunately, it was a year later. Chelsea was uh, 13 years old. She was a member of a soccer team coached by a man named John Holler. 
and uh, Mr. Holler pursued her and eventually ended up having a sexual relationship with her, convincing her that uh, he was in love with her and that uh, ultimately they would be married. Uh, John Holler was in his 20s at the time, I think 23 years old, and something like that. Um, not surprising, um, Chelsea became pregnant. And Mr. Holler realized that uh, he was going to be in serious trouble if that was ever disclosed. So he convinced Chelsea to have an abortion and told her that that was the only way they could stay together. They loved her, and if she had the abortion, they would stay together and at least she thought would get married. The abortion is performed. And um, shortly thereafter, Mr. Haller uh, has uh, sex with Chelsea one more time and then tells her it's over. The claims that we brought on behalf of Chelsea and her parents against Planned Parenthood were, one was a failure to report suspected abuse, two, the failure to obtain the consent of her parents for the abortion or even notify them, three was the failure to meet the requirement to have Chelsea seen by a doctor more than 24 hours prior to the abortion. She wasn't informed properly of the, the risks of an abortion, as well as we believed was given misinformation about those risks. Planned Parenthood was taking the position that while a, a woman or a child who had an abortion could have short-term psychological issues, guilt, those sorts of things, that in fact, um, there was really no long-term implications from a psychological point of view. We had talked with a number of experts who said that was nonsense. That many women, and then we didn't say all, but many women have long-term psychological harm caused by having abortions. We, um, through one of my co-counsel, contacted a uh, a woman here in Cincinnati who was and is an expert on psychological harm, primarily post-traumatic stress. She evaluated Chelsea and found, if I recall correctly, post-traumatic stress, depression, suicidal ideation, and made the correlation that her um, suicidal attempts were related directly to the abortion. Um, that was a game changer in that case. We had already, I believe at that point, gotten a judgment against Planned Parenthood for failure to do the 24-hour requirement with respect to doctors. So we had a judgment already, and the issue was gonna be what were the damages at that point. I don't know what went on at Planned Parenthood at that point, but this is my belief. I believe that Planned Parenthood could not risk having a judgment against them in which a uh, really a, a renowned psychologist, pro-choice psychologist, was going to opine that there was a causal connection between abortion and those forms of uh, psychological harm. And um, I think that in part changed how they decided they wanted to, uh, uh, to uh, proceed. Abortion distortion occurs in cases where claims are made against abortion providers, where uh, principles of law that I believe are well settled are not deemed to be well settled anymore by the courts. They look at some of those principles and in fact uh, apply the law in a way that is contrary to what um, the law has been applied in, in other contexts. We went to the Supreme Court of Ohio to get documents to support our claim that Planned Parenthood had a pattern and practice of not reporting abuse. The court found that these were medical records and it was more important to um, protect the privacy of the women who were the subjects of those reports than it was for us to get the information. Um, 
th those sorts of arguments would never fly, for example, in a, uh, a case involving um, age discrimination or sex discrimination. Those sorts of documents are routinely produced with redacted information so that the plaintiffs are be able to show a pattern in practice. So we saw firsthand what I think was an example of the abortion distortion, and that is had we sought these types of records in other types of claims, I believe we would have gotten them. But because this claim involved abortion, and there was a, many amicus briefs filed with respect to this, um, we lost. And so we lost a, a key component of our case. I first really started thinking about the phrase abortion distortion when I read um, a, a part of a case that was written by former uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, O'Connor. And here's what she said. This court's abortion decisions have already worked a major distortion in the court's constitutional jurisprudence. Today's decision goes further and makes it painfully clear that no legal rule or doctrine is safe from ad hoc nullification by this court when an occasion for its application arises in a case involving state regulation of abortion. The permissible scope of abortion regulation is not the only constitutional issue on which this court is divided, but except when it comes to abortion, the court has generally refused to let such disagreements, however long-standing or deeply felt, prevent it from even-handedly applying uncontroversial legal doctrines to cases that come before it. I think it's hypocritical for Planned Parenthood to take a position about how important it is to um, report suspected and known abuse. They need to look in the mirror. And if they really want to uh, expose this type of horrendous conduct, they need to clean it up. While they're correct in terms of the way they have handled and uh, exposed or attempted to expose the abuse that took place in the Catholic Church, up in Michigan State, and now even in the Me Too movement. I, I think that's great. Uh, what I find to be hypocritical is the media's refusal to do a serious investigation of what occurs at Planned Parenthood. There's been enough information provided to the press with Lila Rose, for example, when she did her exposés, both with respect to the attempts in those situations based upon the videos I saw of people at Planned Parenthood coaching girls not to say certain things so that they wouldn't have to report abuse. Um, also to the, uh, the videos that talked about the um, sex trafficking and the prostitution. Um, clearly, the mainstream media has decided that they don't want to expose and, or do an investigation of to find out what is actually going on at, at Planned Parenthood. Um, you know, I, in my experience, what I would say to people is this. I'm a devout Catholic, and I believe the Catholic Church had to be taken to task for what it did and didn't do with respect to the abuse of, of boys, mostly boys. Um, and I was proud as being part of a prosecuting attorney's office that we brought claims, charges, against the Archdiocese of Cincinnati for uh, its conduct. Um, and I think it gave me credibility because what I would say to people is this. If I, as a, a devout Catholic, would participate in the prosecution of the Catholic Church for what its role was in failure to report abuse, then I have no problems trying to expose what Planned Parenthood does and doesn't do. And the fact of the matter is I get sick and tired of hear, hearing people say about all the great things that Planned Parenthood does.
If you look at the narrative with respect to Planned Parenthood, the narrative always comes back to, look at all the good things we do. Look at all the medical care we provide. Look at all the help we give, um, for example, on uh, breast cancer screening, which quite frankly is not accurate either. My view of that is, so what? Assuming it's all true, assume it's all true. The fact that you do good things doesn't mean you get a pass on the bad things you do.